Good morning. I don't ever say this usually, but I'm going to today. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> I'll explain in a moment. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to welcome you, and it's, been, it's a beautiful day out there. Um, got to enjoy the sunshine for a few minutes a little while ago. And Tony and Rindy, I'm really glad to see you guys here. Welcome to you and your family. Um, hope you enjoy your Sabbath with us and with your family, too. We, um, I was mentioning, oh, no, I, I thought of something that Brother um, Charles had said when, when he says, let's see if I quoted it correctly, was what the council needs is money, right? And I, and I don't know if somebody's going to say amen, so I'll wait for that. What the council needs is money. Now say amen to this, because I, I thought automatically, I thought, all you need is love. <laughs> the Beatles, and they know what they're talking about, right? All you need is love, mm -mm -mm -mm. you know, through the music like that. Today, we, being Valentine's Day, see, I've never been very romantic, and first of all, I was taught that Valentine's Day was pagan, and so we didn't do that, and I know people argued because, well, it's not a religious holiday, it's, you know, and so we just, I just didn't grow up doing that, even though in school we would do the little cards and the be mine, the little heart-shaped candies. And, um, and I think that Martha probably thinks I'm not very romantic or, or used to say that. And one day I realized, I said, I am romantic, just different than what you <laughs> expect. And I, I, I got to explain myself in that, though. See, Martha grew up in Mexico. You think of the mariachis. And they would have, when a guy wanted to pursue a girl, he would stand outside her room, her, her bedroom window. We have a word for that, but I won't, you know. But he would stand out, and he would be up there, and he would bring two or three guys, friends with them, and they'd have their guitars, and they'd do the little, -da 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 -da, you know, and they'd play. And he would sing, no matter how well he sung or not, he would sing to her. And that was called serenade. We, you know, you've heard those. And, and I just could not bring myself to do that. I didn't know the songs. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a foreigner in Mexico, and I got to all of a sudden learn this culture so I could prove my love and all that. But I was bad because even in the, in the simple things, like one time I got off this, this, this public bus, and I started walking here, Monaco! And I went, oh! And she's standing waiting for me to help her down the bus. Okay, <laughs> that was strike one. And then, and then I was... Um, going in I remember another time she would remind me that um, when the guy and the girl are walking down the street and you're walking usually unless sometimes on Mexico Street you gotta walk single file but you'd walk together the guys just walk on the roadside is that true ladies yes. okay because the other thing I wasn't good at strike two now strike three was um, I would forget to get the doors. And the worst thing that ever happened was usually if there was, I was being polite and there would be a woman, you know, a sister in the church or something, oh, let me get that door for you, Martha. Like, I'm glad you're doing that, but. It's... <laughs> so I got three strikes against me, but I think I won it back one day. My, at least my in-laws thought it was pretty cool. I was walking one time and we were walking one of those moments, single file down the Mexico City sidewalks. And we were coming up to the subway, and I saw this guy, and as Martha's walking along, and um, he was following her like this. And I came up next to her. I was watching him the whole time, and I stuck, he was sitting down on the steps. And I stuck my fist in his face, and I said, cuidado, which means be careful. <laughs> and then I realized he looked like a gang member. I started pushing Martha. Let's get in the subway. Let's go. <laughs> my family had a great laugh at that, and they still do that now and then. Cuidado. <laughs> Today, Mexico celebrates, and all over the world, people celebrate love, and Mexico goes further, at least, I don't know if other countries, but they call it el día de, de la amor y la amistad, which means the day of love and friendship. So it isn't just your sweetheart, but just love all around. And um, here's an interesting thing about St. Valentine of Rome, um, and, and the reason why I wrote this one down, it really jumped out at me as I was kind of researching, going over information about Valentine's Day. And um, he was imprisoned for performing weddings for soldiers who were forbidden to marry and for ministering to Christians. That's, that was a, his 
uh, a legacy that he had left behind. But I thought, per, um, in prison for performing weddings, I thought, what an irony in our day and time. Because when we're talking about love, we have certain types of, there are restrictions and stuff, you know. Um, our church has just, our boards are working on, as a matter of fact, in a business meeting, we're getting ready to pass of what we determine, what God allows. When we're talking about romantic love, eros, is what we're going to do with that um, and allow, and how we're going to handle if we, if the world's culture comes at our doorstep, how are we going to handle that? So the first thing is to pass our, our bylaws. We'll have an addendum which will address what we believe as believers and Christians. Um, and we actually got it from another church down the road that was passing it out to all the churches to you rewrite it the way you need to. And we didn't do much changes, did we? we it was enough. It was very well worded. And it's sad that we're at that point. But today is a reminder of not that kind of love, not an illicit love, but a love that can be romantic, husband and wives, um, even girlfriends and boyfriends, but there's, you know, there's more limits there. But, but also a love that's more general. The message, the title is called A Little Too Cheerful. And it's kind of might seem off topic, but I think you might pick it up in a little bit. But I want you to open your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 27. And by the way, we're taking a break from, we've been kind of studying in 1 John, and we, today's a day of about love, so we want to talk about love. All you need is love. Chapter 27 of Proverbs, verse 14. He that blesses his friend with a loud voice rises early, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. This other version says, if you wake your friend in the early morning by shouting, rise and shine, it will sound to him more like a curse than a blessing. Have you ever had that experience? So see, how many of you are morning people? We don't like you sometimes. <laughs> how many of you are not morning people? You're like me, late night people. Is it true you don't like the morning people sometimes? I remember one time, um, my father, my stepfather, when I was a boy, um, one time woke me up, and it sticks in my mind, and it just irritated me. I think we were going to go fishing or something, but I was laying on the floor. I don't know why. I was in the living room or something, and he came up, and he kind of, with his foot, wake up, boy, you know, and I just, I, this didn't set well with me, and I think it was just tired and grouchy and cranky, you know, um, but I think a lot of it had to do when, when I was younger, like five years old, my father was in the Air Force and he was a fireman and so he worked one day on and one day off. And the days off that he was, I would get scared at night and I would walk and I'd go creep into my mom's room and she'd hear my bones crack and she'd go, Monaco, are you in my room? And I'd say, yeah, I'm scared. And whenever he would come home and I would be in the bedroom, he would go, go to your room, boy. So I think maybe there was some bad blood there for me. But none of us that are night people like to be woken up with somebody shouting. And that makes sense to me when I, when I read this verse. If you wake your friend in the early morning by shouting, rise and shine, it will be, sound to him more like a curse than a blessing. Because I'm thinking maybe the person has good intentions, but he just used it at the wrong time. And you can do that. Have you ever seen that? Even in other circumstances where you are trying to be helpful, and instead of being helpful, you're making it worse. Because you're not saying the right things, or you're not knowing how to approach the subject. And you intended well. But as I did more studying on this verse... I realize that it could be possibly that it has a whole different meaning. Let me, let me share with you a little bit. And you could follow along in your sermon notes or some places you can write. Um, this first one explains it this way. This is a commentary. It says, excessive zeal in praising raises suspicions of selfishness. Let me read that again. Excessive zeal, rise and shine, or hey, how are you doing this morning? 
Excessive zeal and praising raises suspicions of selfishness. Kind of the word flattery. What do we understand about flattery? You know that flattery is kind of when somebody's flattering you, you get a little suspicious. He's up to something. He's buttering me up. There's more to be said. This one says, um, this is the pulpit ministry. It says, he that blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning. What is meant is ostentatious salutation, which puts itself forward in order to stand well with a patron. In other words, the person who's going in the work and he's, hey, boss, how you doing? He's trying to make, kind of get a connection with the boss. puts it forward and to stand well with a patron, a boss, and to be beforehand with other servile competitors for favor. If I'm nicer to my boss, he'll like me and he'll think I'm better than they are. And so when a person is overly zealous, a little too cheerful, that raises suspicions. And this finishes by saying, juvenile satirize such parasitical effusion. Big words and stuff, but basically it's saying they made fun of that. And they, they talked about how people would do that. And, and so you see all these, um, these examples. You, we, we can watch shows and see, or we can see um, situations where we know somebody's buttering somebody up. Um, I'd like you to turn your Bibles now with me. We're going to go to a different approach, taking in this idea of what we said and with love and all that. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. What does that mean? What's dissimulation? Martha uses that word to, with me a lot. Um, she says when I'm angry, or, or not angry, just upset, I don't hide it very well. Is that true? You see it on my face? She says, you don't dissimulate very well. You don't know how to dissimular, is how they say in Spanish. Which is a good thing. Dissimulation means hypocrisy. What you see in my face is what I'm feeling inside a lot of times. Or it just gives me away. Maybe I'm trying not to. But, but she, it says love, here in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Hypocrisy. You know what hypocrisy means? The Greek word is actually referring to acting. It's pretending. It's when they would put on that mask. You ever seen the mask for theater, drama? They have a frowny face and they have a smiley face so this way you put the mask on nobody knows what you really look like underneath you're with the mask you're able to make a character because they see that smiley face and they see this is a happy person at least he's acting this way and so hypocrisy was used in Greek to refer to an actor but Paul is using it to talk about how we mask our, our feelings whether with our facial expression or putting a literal mask on there or our actions. And Paul is telling us here, let love be without dissimulation. And just to finish a verse, he adds, abhor which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Before I continue on, I, I find myself, there's times that I don't know if there's a kind of a man thing, and again, going back to my childhood and being taught men don't act this way, they don't do this, you don't see a man, uh, you don't cry, men don't cry. Martha gets after me a little bit because if I'm watching something and it hits my heart or I'm, or I'm talking about a circumstance or something that happened at church and I'm moved by what's going on, I'm, I start to turn away and cry, and she goes, stop doing that, stop hiding that you want to cry. There's nothing wrong with you crying. Do you men suffer the same thing? And then at the same time we say, we have a hard time saying, I love you. And more and more here with some men, we're, we're saying that to each other here in this church. I love you, brother so-and-so. And it may be a little bit difficult. We feel kind of, I don't know. I've, at first it seems weirded out. But ask Craig, you know, I, I might feel weirded out, but Craig, you know, and not that Craig and I say I love you too. <laughs> I didn't bring him up to, 
But Craig remembers in Mexico, it's a whole different situation. My brother-in-law publicly will hug me and kiss me on the, on the neck or on the cheek, and I kiss him back. Because I've learned all that stuff rubbed off on me. I walk with my wife, and I go, ooh, let me get on the outside. All the things that she had to teach me. And, um, and I look back at Mexico, and I said, I learned a lot from them. And even for the short times that we're there on the mission trips, Luke knows this, right? The love that you feel, and you feel it, it's not with dissimulation. And they hug you, their actions show it, it all works together. But we have a hard time, and men have a hard time saying, I love you. There's one person, one time I here in this church, I said, I love you, and he says, I appreciate you. <laughs> and I, I went, oh, can I take my words back? <laughs> I went out, and I was all gushy, and, you know, and... But I understand, I understand that I grew up that way. I understand about the, the macho, the redneck. Not that rednecks would always say that, but I, I understand the mentality. Men don't tell other men you love them. I think the Bible says otherwise. And it teaches us otherwise. But it's not easy for us. And it's worse when you go out on a limb and it doesn't get reciprocated. The word appreciate means to increase in value. So I don't dismiss that word. I increase you in value. We use it for economic terms. When you're saying my house is appreciating or depreciating, right now mine is finally starting to appreciate. It's growing in price. It's growing. So I appreciate the word appreciate. But I don't think it really gets to the point still. We muster up to say I love you too. Turn with me to John chapter 21. When I, talked, when I thought about that saying, I love you, well, I appreciate you. Oh, wrong word then. I thought of this interaction, this exchange. But as I studied it, I learned there's even some more deep, there's deeper meaning to this. John chapter 21 and we're going to start in verse 15. We're going to read three verses, 15, 16, and 17. But before we go there, you have to remember the, what's going on in the context with John and Jesus. John is a, or not John, Peter, Simon Peter. John is writing, and he was called the beloved, so I guess there was no problem there. He had no problem showing affection. Peter showed his affection by being loyal, being strong, being... Remember what he told the Lord before the crucifixion? Lord, if all these guys deny you, I will never leave you. Oh, yes, you will. Yeah. No, I will never do that. Peter, I tell you, before this night's over, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he did. And he ran away and wept. And the Lord is, I believe here, is reestablishing that connection. He does it three times, and I think it's an offset the three times that he denied him. But it's interesting to see the, the word play in it. In it we read, So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep, my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. In verse 17, he saith unto him, the third time, this is Jesus saying, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. In your sermon notes, I believe I, no, I don't have them in there, but, um, there's a word play that's going on here. See, in the first verse, in verse 15, Jesus says, he uses the word, the verb form of agape. Agapas me. And Simon uses the word philose. Um, I, I have a strong affection for you. And Jesus says in verse 16, he says the same thing. Do you love me, agapas me? And Simon re replies again, philose. You know that. 
And finally in 17, Jesus go, uses the same term, Felis. Or at least John is using it. And I think there's a purpose in why John is using it. I don't know what Jesus was using. He was probably speaking Hebrew with, with Simon Peter. And I don't know if there was a difference there. But John is making a point here. And I used to think that the, the way Jesus was asking the first two times that, John, that Peter was um, responding in a lesser level. In your notes, you'll see that it says agapao, this is the verb, is of the mind love. That's a determined love. That's a love that says, I have willed that I will love you. That's what God does with us. We may not be lovable, but God loves us. We may not be worthy, but God loves us. And that's the term, especially the noun agape, because the word agapao was used often in, in, in other circumstances, even outside the Bible. But agape is in the Bible. And it's the word that's mainly used. There's only one other time outside the Bible that is used. And when agape is used, it's talking about the love that God has. But it's a love that takes the will, a decision. And the way that Peter is responding is of the heart love. And you might say, well, isn't the heart love better than mind love? I think both of them are important. See, the heart love is saying, you, you can't tell in my heart. You can't see how it comes out. John might do it by leaning on your breast, on your, you know, during the supper. That's why he's called the beloved, because he's affectionate. He didn't have a problem clinging to Jesus. Peter showed it by his loyalty and by the love and his fervor. It was heartfelt. Let's look at a, a couple more verses. Paul writes about this again. He writes it over and over again, obviously, but here's some more that he talks about this love that we should have. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity, is love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned. And unfeigned just means it's sincere, it's not fate. All of them come together. But, but the intention of the commandment is to have real love. That's what we know about the Ten Commandments. It isn't just a, a list of stuff to check off. It's to teach us. It's to really show us what love is about. And especially when we think of Jesus' commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. That sets the standard pretty high. It doesn't say love your neighbor as yourself anymore. Because maybe I don't love myself all that much. But Jesus said, love like I loved you. And Paul is reminding us we need to be loving each other. And I think that even saying I love you is a good start. 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified yourselves and obeying the truth toward the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. What's interesting about that, he uses both ver verbs in there. One is Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. We know that Philadelphia, the city we know, is the city of brotherly love. But that's the part that says the love of the unfeigned love of the brethren, sincere love of the brethren. So he's using the phileo, that heartfelt love. He says, see that you love one another, the agapao love. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. So you put the two together and how powerful is that love? Same book. Chapter 4, verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity, love among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. And that's that agape love, because that's what God does with us. He covers up a lot. Now, he doesn't just blow them off. He paid for them. He, he gave his son to die on the cross for them. So it's not just a simple 
brush off, just wipe it out, I f just ignore it. But love covers a multitude of sins. So I want to ask you, and this is a question that's in there, and I'm, I'm just speculating, I'm just um, brainstorming with you. Could we say that a determined Christian love, that agape love, can become a heartfelt love? Where I purposely start, and this is what I, where I'm going with this, where I go and I say, um, I see my brother and I, and, and we may have a strong, you know, I, I really appreciate you and all this stuff. And I go out a little further and say, Gordon, I love you. Thank you. I had that happen a couple weeks ago with somebody. We had a little bit of a spat and we, we had a kind of, we weren't, you know, angry and all this stuff, but we were not in agreement at the moment. And the first thing we said, well, we had to kind of reconcile. And then we said, I love you. And he responded, I love you too. And we say, well, what if I don't feel it? Isn't that a good place to start, though, to say I love you? That's what I'm asking with this question. Could, it, could we be with that determined love that I'm going to love you and I'm going to start with my words, that the actions will start to follow behind it? You know, I think it's really interesting as I wrap this up, going back to Proverbs 27, 14. I told you, maybe you might scratch your head at where the connection is. We read in 14, he says, He that blesses his son with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted. Did I say son? He that blesses his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. And you're thinking, what's that got to do with the message of love and it's Valentine's Day and all this stuff? Well, remember we said that that was probably a term of flattery and the, the cheerful person in the morning was only doing it to gain something. And we're learning now that we're admonished to love one another. And that hasn't been easy. And, and for this church, it's been harder even. It's been harder for us because we've learned to adapt to each other. We've learned to adopt each other's way of thinking. And that, does it, that makes things more difficult. But if my wife and I can come from two different cultures and learn to love one another, I think I can do that with brethren of the, mostly the same beliefs. And I think it's ironic that for the last verse that I'm going to read, it's just a few verses later, it says, Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. You see how that works together? And imagine a loving relationship where we trust each other. And we're able to say, I'm approaching you, I want to help you, and you're going to help me, and we work, and that's, that's how we grow in this relationship. So I'm concluding with this, and I've figured this out, and you, you'll see it on your sermon notes, in that little picture of that heart. If you're like me, I may not be very romantic on Valentine's Day. I don't give much attention to all the hype. I did take it this time. As I was preparing this message, I went and bought my wife a little puppy, stuffed puppy, and made a little card for her and said, I wanted to give this to you. I never do that for Valentine's Day. I guess I need to do that more often. But it can be when I remember all these things, I can remember that if it takes Valentine's to remind me that we need to have Christian love and that my, I have a need to love sincerely. See, I want it to be more just than words because we're told to love in word and in deed. So I want it to be words. I want to get over that fear of saying I love you and that they're going to reject me. 
I want to love sincerely, and I don't want it to be a shallow, cheerful gesture. I want it to be real. I want it to be without dissimulation, without hypocrisy. Will you stand with me as we pray? Right now is a moment to commit to that. And there's two ways you can commit to that. As we pray, you in your own heart, you can pray out loud if you'd like. I don't, it doesn't bother me if you pray. As a matter of fact, I love it when people pray out loud. I, I like those atmosphere. Because then I feel like God's people are speaking. But you can say, Lord, help me to love the way you loved. Teach me to love. Help me to love the way Peter loved. Maybe we need some of that phileo love. Heartfelt love. And after you're finished praying, find somebody, a couple people, and say, I love you. Don't tell them I appreciate you. Try to say, I love you. Even if it's just a little bit. Bow your heads with me. Father, we come before you. And Lord, we need your help because we know that we show that we're your children when we love one another. Of all the commandments, that's the one that stands first and foremost. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But that's not easy, Lord. We're in human circumstances and we have issues and we don't, some people we don't know very well and so obviously it starts, there's a trust level, there's, I, we, we need to grow, we need to understand each other but better. Lord, teach us the love and then help us, Father, make it come to a point where it's a heartfelt love a love where we yearn to see each other a love where we enjoy being with each other father i thank you for the friends throughout my the years here lord that have been my friends for a long time and for their being comrades and and um Lord, we desire that in our church. We make connections with a lot of people, and then there's other people we just don't do very well. But we want to be your children, and we want to act the way you have commanded us to act. And so we ask you to help us. Teach us to love one another. And we thank you for this day for reminding us of that. And we bless you, Father, for the fellowship that we're going to have in a few minutes, Lord, as we talk and visit, have snacks together, Lord, and then we go home, maybe have guests or whatever, Lord, that we spend time today, your Sabbath, time that we can set aside from our regular work so that we, we can do exactly these things. And I think that's your intention, that we grow in love with one another. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing song. Let's take our hymnals and turn the page. Uh, there, look at it first. Uh, 3.23 Jesus loves even me page 3.23 I am so glad the Father in Him Tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. 
Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. <clears throat> He's our great example, and we can take that love he gives us and return it to each one of our our friends and loved ones and to those out in the world. Dear Lord, we thank you for this message this morning and that you bless each one of us with love. You command us to love each other and to love all mankind. And we pray that you just be with us and help us to love you evermore. In your holy name, dear Jesus, amen. <clears throat>